Thank you very much indeed, Laura. It's a great um, privilege to be here. I was, I was taken with what, the, uh, what was said by the first speaker um, today, saying you'd only been in tourism 14 days. I mean, the important thing for me to remember is I've only been in Canada for three days. This is the third day, so I'm not going to try and talk about Canada very much unless I can rely on some statistics. But I'll come back to, the, to that at the end of um, what I'm going to say. I want to introduce the idea of responsible tourism to you and why it's important. I want to talk then about what's happened in the UK um, and, and to, to, to share that with you. I want to talk about the business case for engaging with the triple bottom line of sustainability. I want quickly to look at some international examples. And then at the end, I want to look at what's the relevance to Canada and probably to embarrass the UK um, by what I'm going to say with some statistics at the end. I'm going to go quite quickly through these slides. I've got rather a lot. I'm determined to hit the 45-minute maximum, hopefully a bit shorter. Um, all of the PowerPoints, as I understand it, will be available to you on the website afterwards, so you'll be able to go back to them. And I'm not going to talk about everything that's on every slide. I'm just going to um, put them up. So please look at the slides as well as, um, as listen to me. But what's the issue about tourism? We've, we've already heard this morning about the, the seven sectors or of the tourism industry. But the fundamental problem, it seems to me, is not about the industry. The fundamental problem is about the assets that the tourism industry uses to make money. And the, those assets that they use are essentially um, the natural and cultural heritage that people see around them. I mean, this hotel benefits massively from that view out of the window, but it makes no contribution to the maintenance of that view. And that's the fundamental problem. Now, the guy who first pointed this out was Sir Colin Marshall at the launch of the Tourism for Tomorrow Awards in 1994. So this is not some dangerous left-wing perspective. This is one of the um, most significant tourism development professionals in the world in terms of the impact that BA used to have on tourism development around the world. It's no longer true, but it used to be true. And he said that the tourism and travel industry is essentially the renting out for short-term lets of other people's environments. And the problem with this is that the people who take the benefit from those short-term lets are the people in the industry, either the businesses or the employees. And you wonder sometimes in rural areas why people resent tourism so much. It's because for them, there is no benefit from the tourism. In many of the areas I work in around the world, the local community is not benefiting from tourism. Some of them are, obviously, through employment, or through supplying into the industry. But many of them do not see that benefit. Where I live, in a small town in Kent, tourists for me, although I, you know, in theory I'm in favour of developing tourism, but at the personal level, tourism for me clogs up my local pub, brings us too much traffic, and means I can't get to the post office as quickly as I could if it wasn't crowded with tourists. Now, I don't, as an individual in the town I live in, I don't benefit from tourism. And there's a problem in that about the relationship between tourism the tourism industry and the different sectors of it, and the communities, the landscapes in which we operate. And unfortunately, people take that landscape for free. There's a major cost in maintaining protected landscapes, particularly in the developing world, but also here. It means that they're not used for other kinds of economic development. But tourism, the travellers, don't really make a contribution to the maintenance of that conserved heritage. And in that is an inequality, um, which is difficult to address. On the other hand, of course, we, although we take our holidays in other people's homes and therefore we cause our pollution when we travel to those other people's homes, but the big benefit is that there is an economic opportunity to purchase additional goods and services. And the big question for me about tourism development is after you've got the tourists to come to Alberta, how do you spread that tourism development around Alberta and how do you get people to spend money which benefits the local economy and the people who live and work in Alberta. There are lots of examples of tourism around the world where the benefit from tourism goes to the tourism businesses, but doesn't necessarily benefit the local community in a broad scale. If you take Norfolk, for example, in the UK, that has one of the lowest multipliers from the economic impact of tourism because most of the things which are actually made and produced in Norfolk, tourists don't buy. They don't buy grain. They don't buy raw meat, if you can't find a way of producing that as something which a tourist will buy and then making sure the tourist buys it, you're not necessarily going to get the local economic benefit from tourism. And that's where one of the really big challenges for tourism is as we move forward. How do we spread the benefits and how do we 
engage with the local economy. Law has given a very good example, I think, by bringing the, the goods from the, from the local farmers' market. But how do we broaden that? How do we grow it so that the economic benefit is much more tangible for local communities? Because that's the main way in which local communities engage with and benefit from tourism. I took the photograph on the right. I'm still actually quite embarrassed by it. Um, I did ask permission, but I don't think it was a very equal exchange. Um, they didn't know I was going to use this photograph all around the world. Um, and the slogan on the left actually comes from a campaign run by a Swedish NGO in Slovenia, a different country, but basically saying your everyday life is someone else's adventure. And of course, a large part of the reason why people will come to Alberta is to see how people live here. But the people who live here, the people who farm, for example, won't necessarily see a benefit from tourism, except that the cars drive past and, and clutter up their roads. So there's an inequality in this, which we need, I think, to at least think about and try to find ways of addressing. We have a word for it. I mean, technically, we call it gazing as academics. In Cornwall, which suffers from a great deal of tourism and also benefits from it, they call it grockling. So tourists are grocklers. And that's obviously not a nice word to be called a grockler. Um, but it is the reality for many people of what a tourist is. It's somebody who's just coming to gaze at them, and they're not making any benefit from that. So what is the purpose of tourism? What's it for? Well, from different perspectives, it's for different things. <coughs> for many people, particularly in government, it's simply about more tourists arriving, because that's what the industry wants. The industry will constantly say, we want more tourists. So the Minister of Tourism will be... Um, assessed by their ability to bring in more tourists, more arrivals, because those arrivals are potential consumers. So that's one way of thinking about it. But perhaps more important, to think about who's arriving and what are they spending? How long are they staying? What's the economic benefit to Alberta from tourism rather than the actual number of arrivals? And then if we look at the world in a slightly different way, for individuals and for businesses, it's often a, it, the question is, what is my economic benefit from tourism? Now, for some people, the answer is zero. For others, it may be negative in the sense that the tourists create more problems for them than they bring benefit. For the community, maybe for some members of the community it's positive, for others it may be negative. But there's no simple answer to the question of what the purpose is of tourism. It will have different purposes for different people. And often the struggle between the industry and the government is about industry capturing government to meet their needs for more arrivals rather than government's objective, which may well be around economic growth, economic development, spreading benefits throughout Alberta, bringing in marginal and disadvantaged communities, but those are not necessarily the objectives of the industry. We can't just assume that there's a, an alliance between industry and government. In my experience, you have to work quite hard to make that work so that both sides benefit. Government, then, for me, is at the centre of this. And I was very excited by some of the things I was hearing last night. It's, there are not many places where you find such an engaged and enlightened attitude um, from government. Lots of other things tourism can do, of course. It's not just about economic development. It can bring benefits to conservation, bring economic development, it can maintain heritage. Very importantly, it can produce taxation for government. It can do all of these things. It can bring regeneration. But we get the kind of tourism that we make of it. We have to take control of the tourism and control it. These are both genuine adverts. They're not spoofs. The one on the left, an airline advertising Budapest, Gdansk, Warsaw, Krakow, some of the world's most beautiful cities, essentially somewhere to go for cheap beer. Now, can you imagine how that feels if you live in Warsaw? Pretty unpleasant, actually. A lot of anger. Luckily, Wizz has gone bust. The company on the right, Cricketers, placed its advert once. I use it not because Cricketers is a bad company. They are not. Cricketers are a great company, and I need to say that. But the advert is honest about what tour operators think. Once a place gets spoiled, they'll move on. Don't make any mistake about that. There is no loyalty from international tour operators. If they can't sell it because it's been spoiled, they'll go. They don't have a long-term commitment in the same way that a local hotel has no choice. It's very difficult to move the hotel. But of course, many hotels you see reducing value over time as destinations become spoiled. So the big question is, it's a multi-stakeholder process. You need the engagement of government. What will business contribute to that? And I think, in a sense, that's part of the debate today. So what is responsible tourism? To move on to the next set of things I wanted to talk about. It's critically, and I think this for me is the, 
the simplest and easiest way of understanding what it is. It's creating better places for people to live in and better places for people to visit. But what's important about that, because we could probably all subscribe to this, what's important about that is the order. It's about saying, and this is where government comes in, it's about making better places for people to live in first, and that will actually make better places for people to visit. The very same things, the, the view of that landscape, for example, which make this a good place to live in some ways, also makes it a good place to visit. We know there's an immense amount of diversity about that. So what is responsible tourism? It's a market opportunity for the industry and for local communities, and it's an approach to managing destinations. But that managing of destinations is a whole of government function. We had some interesting conversations about how that's going to be carried through in Alberta. There is some global thinking, and in a sense, that's what I want to contribute to today. But the critical question is not the global thinking. There's been plenty of that. The question is the local action and the willingness to share what works. Now, I want to just...